We gotta let Hannah in. She's on her way in. Okay. Yep. There she there we is. Go. Hey. I think, we're, I think we're ready to start, right? Yes. We are. Okay. You ready, Miss Kelly? Ready. Okay. Can I? Uh, sorry for the delay there, folks, but we're going to call the April 16th, 2020 Board of Education meeting to order today. Um, I'll start with, uh, we're going to do a quick roll call vote of who is here. Um, if you, if I say your name, or can you just say here? So everybody at home understands, we can't see everybody on the screen. Dave Long? Here. Ann Cunningham? Here. Meg Steckley? Meg? Sorry, here, I said here, but I was muted. Uh, Matt Fink? Here. Matt Mattress? Here. Matt Sullivan? Here. And we are joined by Dr. Aaron Johnson. Uh, Dr. John Hunter. Here. Good evening. Meg Steckley. Pat, Pat Kelly. Here. We're joined by our student representatives, Hannah Roscoe. Here. Here. Elizabeth Morato. Here. And we're also joined by James Brennan. Hello, everyone. Karen Finter. Hi, everybody. And Chrissy Amiga. Hello. I think that's everybody. So with that, we uh, roll call vote or roll call who's on the uh, meeting. We're going to go ahead and start with the pledge of the flag. If everybody could rise and we'll start with the pledge. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, the flag to the flag of the United States of America. United States of America. To the republic. To the republic. For which it stands. For which it stands. One nation. One nation. Under God. Under God. Indivisible. Indivisible. With, with justice liberty, for all. And justice for all. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, we're back to our meeting. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Kelly, for setting this meeting up with Dr. Johnson today. So. We'll start with uh, first thing is approval of the agenda. First of all, Dr. Johnson, is there any changes to the agenda tonight? You're muted. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Uh, we're going to add G8, uh, Mr. Vay. It's an update of the budget for the Board of Education. Hang on a second, I'm just getting to my Your G8 new business. Okay. G8 budget update. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, with that, any other agenda changes? No, sir. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and ask for a vote to approve the agenda as presented. Can I have a motion, please? I move. Thank you, Mr. Metcher. Second, please. I'll second it. Thank you, Ms. Cunningham. Um, any questions from the board before we go ahead and vote? On being had, we'll go ahead and vote to approve the agenda. Can you all say aye? Aye. 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 Ms. Kelly, that looks like 7 0. Okay, next item on the agenda is approval of the it's Ms. Kelly, can I have a resolution, please? The recommended resolution is be it resolved that the minutes of the March 19, 2020 Audit Committee business meeting and the April 2nd, 2020 study session be approved as presented. Can I have a motion, please? I'll so move it. I'll move. So, yeah, I'm going <laughs> to give that to Mr. Sullivan in a second, please. Second. Thank you, Mr. Fink. Is there any questions or comments from the board on the minutes? I'm being had, Dr. Johnson, anything to add? Okay, nothing from Dr. Johnson. We'll go ahead and vote on this. All those in favor say aye. 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 
Oh yeah, that's seven zero also. Okay, the next item on the agenda is good news. Uh, Dr. Johnson, are we having our student representatives read this today since they're joining us? We are, Mr. Bay. So I'm um, <clears throat> very help, happy to welcome back Hannah and Elizabeth uh, to the team. Uh, so they, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, were not able to join us for the last two meetings. Um, so we're very excited to welcome them back. I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. For the 12th year in a row and 19th time in 21 years, Western Andertoy is one of the best communities for music education in America. We were chosen by the North American Music Merchants Foundation. Districts are selected for an exceptionally high commitment and access to music education. Colbert Brook Elementary School kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Barb Florek, was honored by WROC TV with Channel 8's prestigious Golden Apple Award. She has taught kindergarten for 20 years. Senior Garrett Han Pendrazio, Junior Kara Saunders, and Mr. Joe Rivellino, who teaches technology at IHS and Dake Junior High School, have all been putting the 3D printers at their homes to good use. They've been making comfort band straps that connect to the elastic bands on either side of a protective mask. Senior Alana Page was honored by WROC TV Channel 8 on its Section 5's best show as the area's top girls basketball player. And senior bowler Ryan Chenier was named top comeback athlete. He overcame a back injury suffered just before the holidays. The online show was Tuesday. A pre produced TV show is 7 p.m. Saturday. Iroquois Middle School teacher Kelly Petro organized a flip grid mask singer contest for students to do digitally while at home. Students and staff submitted videos with a sticker over their face. It was a fun way to stay connected, Petro said. Our high achieving DECA club excelled again at the annual state competition. Nearly half of the 25 IHS students who competed in the 60th annual New York State DECA, bleh, DECA career conference qualified for nationals. Those 11 seniors, Sean Jarrett, Nate Kistler, and Matt McCulloch, Juniors, Mara Ali, Andrew Bidwell, Lauren Day, Lauren Gangarosa, Emma Palumbo, and Tracy Williams, and sophomores, Cooper Branch and Colton Mantha. Arondequit High School cook manager, Betty Doyle, won a school food service contest sponsored by Dole Foods. Her peachy salad won second place. Doyle and Lord Santana, along with school lunch director, Betsy Lo Judas, have coordinated meals since March 16th that is now serving more than 1,000 meals daily to students in need. Okay, that's our good news today. Again, thank you for reading that, our student reps and joining us to, today at our meeting and welcome back. Again, thank you to all the staff that do all the great things for our students, even when we aren't uh, there face-to-face. -face. So um, the next item on the agenda is public comment. This is on hold uh, to the executive order and uh, Ms. Kelly, uh, Dr. Johnson and Mr. D. Veronica are working on a way that we can incorporate public comment back into the meeting. And I believe Dr. Johnson, correct me if I'm wrong, we're looking at that on the meeting that we, the board approves the budget, which I think is tentatively for um, like May 7th or 14th, depending on the calendar. Is that correct? Or no, I'm sorry, 21st? We're looking for May 14th. May 14th. So just want to remind the public that we are working on the public comment portion of that is not required, but we would feel it's important that we try to get that back to the uh, um, community to allow for that, especially at the budget vote. So please uh, bear with us as we uh, explore best practices on the way to do that. So I'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is superintendent's report. I'll turn this over to Dr. Johnson. You're muted. You're muted. Thank you for the reminder. Um, well, welcome back folks. And um, welcome again to our student representatives. It's great to have those folks back uh, with us and joining us at the meeting. So I wanna start out by giving thanks again to our food service, our security, security team, our admin team, um, our staff at large, our buildings and grounds. Um, we have a lot going on across the district, um, including the, uh, the instruction, the essential operations, uh, including meals. And I just wanna thank all of those folks for everything that they're doing at this time. <clears throat> 
So in the last week, uh, week and a half, uh, Dr. Hunter has been with us and he's been working with our uh, labor unions and, um, and coming to some agreements around um, continuing operations and continuing instruction, as I just talked about. And so at this point, if you look in your administrative content, uh, content Board of Education, you'll find some MOAs there for your, um, for your information. Um, them, the, the MOAs allow us to continue business um, as we need to uh, through this pandemic. And I just wanna send a, a note of appreciation to the union leadership for their work around that. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Finter and Ms. Miga with us tonight. And um, they uh, were able to coordinate some information that went out to families last week around grading. Um, and so very soon we're gonna be sending some information home to families around third quarter grades uh, in essence right now, the, um, the third quarter grades um, are gonna be reduced to a, a, a pass or an incomplete for grades five through 12, uh, giving so the families information just around um, some general progress for the students and making sure that um, uh, we're being very flexible as far as the last few weeks that we've went, been through, uh, knowing that the, the students and families like, like ourselves here at the district, We've just been trying to make sense of everything and uh, getting all of our ducks lined up um, and ready to move forward and, and, uh, and manage ourselves as we can. So uh, the next phase, we've been talking about quarter four and um, looking at that, I just wanna make sure that everybody understands for quarter four, um, well, there's not gonna be any third quarter grades, as I said, but for quarter four, uh, excuse me, for quarter four, uh, there's gonna be a pass or incomplete for grades um, let me get this right, Karen and Chrissy, grades K through four, right? And it's going to be standards-based grading where we have some specific information um, for families and from our staff around the standards that the students are working towards. Uh, in grades five through eight, um, it's going to have a little bit more detail with um, grade eight at Dake, they're gonna have a pass with distinction, but again, it's gonna be aimed towards standards-based grading in those, in those grade levels for our students. Grades nine through 12, uh, we've developed a, something a little bit more uh, complex for those students. It involves um, some, some layers uh, that will uh, denote um, the student's progress. Uh, we're not gonna be recording percentage grades per se, uh, but we're gonna be um, recording things like mastery of the standard, which um, will, will denote that the students have had a very high performance on the assessments and work that have been assigned throughout this closure, uh, proficiency of the standards, um, meeting of the standards at a basic level, uh, approaching the standards, and then not yet showing evidence of the standards. So I just wanna um, thank the staff and Karen and Chrissy for their work around that. Uh, working with the team and working with our principals, we've coordinated some town halls um, for the 21st and the 28th. And so this is a way to provide further communication to our families. Now that we know that the closures are gonna be extended here through the 15th of May. So that was new information from the governor today. Um, and these will be a chance for families to join us live via Facebook. Um, we're gathering some, some, some questions from families right now via a survey um, and that we're gonna be able to use to target uh, some of those topics and try to get information to the families as best we can. I will also use that as an opportunity to gather additional questions and follow up with a FAQ to families. Again, just working on our communication and making sure that um, we're able to provide as much information as we can at this time. Uh, I would also say that uh, regarding athletics, I know that a lot of people have questions around athletics in the spring season and whether or not that's gonna happen. Um, that's still up in the air. We haven't gotten a specific direction yet from the State Athletic Association or from section five, but I think based on, um, based on the fact that the closure is gonna be extended to the 15th, we're prepared now to move forward with some of our planning and go a little bit more deeper into that. So you're gonna hear a little bit more about that from Ms. Schoen, our athletic director. Um, 
So I think at this point, that's all the updates I have to offer. If there's any questions, I can take those. But thank you, Mr. Vay. You're on mute, John. You're muted, John. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Johnson. We'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is report of the treasurer. Uh, Ms. Kelly, can I have the resolution, please? Recommended resolution is be it resolved that the March 31st, 2020 financial statements and treasurer's report be accepted as presented. Motion, please. I'll move it. Thank you, Mr. Long. Second, please. Second. Second. Who was that? Mr. Sullivan? Okay, uh, motion's on the table. First of all, I'll ask uh, Dr. Johnson, is there anything that you would like to add for these reports? Not at this okay. time, Mr. Bay. Okay. Mr. Brennan, is there anything you wanna add? Um, no, nothing beyond that was in our, in the summary piece um, regarding you know, the last pieces of the levy are waiting to be collected from the county. Um, we had discussions um, talking about how there was a little bit, we were a little out of sync in terms of number of payrolls. That's now back in sync. So it's a, it's a good apples to apples comparison in terms of performance of budget, but all in all the budget um, to date has been performing well. Okay. Any questions from the board? Okay, there are none being had. We'll go ahead and vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Kelly, that looks like seven zero to me from the screen. Okay, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is report of the leadership staff. We're gonna start with our curriculum area and um, I'll turn this over to Dr. Johnson. So as the Board of Education knows, this year we partnered with the Children's Institute um, out of Rochester and they have supported us in doing some planning here and gathering some information. Um, and so uh, Ms. Finter and Ms. Miga have been, um, have been leading that on our end. And with that, uh, we received back uh, feedback from our audit. Uh, so we did a comprehensive audit, which included gathering information from many of our stakeholders that was uh, synthesized and uh, reviewed with us recently. So we thought that it would be important uh, to update the Board of Education as far as the progress of that work. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Ms. Finter and Ms. Miga. Sure. Okay, so um, as Aaron mentioned, or Dr. Johnson mentioned, um, Children's Institute came um, uh, and started working with us early this fall. And we put together a comprehensive stakeholder focus group um, series of two days of, of small groups of, of key participants coming together to share their um, understanding around where uh, we were at that time with um, social emotional components within our instructional program, um, the vision for SDL, what our student strengths and areas of needs are, um, the strategies that we're using and, and what kinds of professional development was available. In addition to that, they um, ran through a comprehensive survey that was um, electronically distributed to all of our teaching uh, faculty and school staff. It was um, sent out to parents within the community. Um, and so we really got a great response and some great information that we're, we're starting to um, get to dive into as we just got the report um, at the end of February from Children's Institute and use that information to plan forward. So if we take a look at this first slide, um, it just includes what were the items that were either included in the survey that was sent to families and staff or some of the pieces that were included through the focus areas. Um, so including obviously those bigger components of social emotional learning, um, but also what are our students' strengths and needs? Um, what are some of the strategies we're currently using? Um, or at least where is perception around those strategies that we are, aren't using? And of course, um, what training and professional development needs will we need in the future? 
And we've included in the uh, administrative content in, in board docs, the full, uh, you know, 60, 70 page report for you that has lots of um, the data behind some of their findings and the information that we'll share tonight. So you can certainly dig in. We just wanted to give you a snippet of some of the data that was presented to us in terms of our response rate. So this just kind of gives you the, the flavor for the comprehensive nature of the survey of the participants that um, voiced um, their ideas and their concerns when the survey was administered in district. So one of the first areas that the survey and focus groups took a look at was um, the definition or understanding of what SEL is within a district. Um, and certainly, as you'll see throughout the presentation, there is a high interest within our district among um, all staff, students, and, and family members. Um, at the time of this uh, survey, there was a feeling that there wasn't a consistent definition of SEL. So people were really looking for, we know this is the right next step, this is um, what we need to do, but what exactly is it and what does it look like moving forward? So um, they also surveyed um, in both the stakeholder groups as well as on the electronic survey, you know, some information to, to fuel the vision and development of the vision for SEL. And, and all surveyed thought that um, really it was the district's responsibility to set that vision um, and um, really thinking about, you know, the autonomy that individual buildings have to have um, in order to implement some of the components of that vision. So, so staff had a strong desire um, to have the district set that direction and that vision, uh, but they wanted their flexibility in how um, some of those components were implemented to meet the, the unique um, needs of each of our 10 buildings. And going along with that, it was surveyed how staff view themselves as um, the the drivers of of this focus and and really all the respondents showed that they thought they had at least a small role to play um, in SEL and many actually felt that they had a central or moderate role um, and that you can see some of the different groups that include themselves in that which is really all of our staff and faculty um, within the district so um, and you can see only 2% of teachers indicated a desire for a small role. So it goes back to that bigger piece that there's a large buy-in within our district to support SEL and continue to investigate it. And um, really um, emphasizing that all in mentality from our staff. School climate was another topic addressed in the survey and in the focus groups and and climate is, um, you know, a very interesting. It is some in some cases inherent to each of the different buildings. Um, so you, you really do have to dive into that report and into all of the different data charts that are are represented to drill into um, some of the information about school climate. But um, without a surprise, you know, some of the perceptions of climate, it varied by building, it varied by grade level. Um, you know, it, there were some perception differences, um, even though in, in some um, staff members' minds, the, the, there are different needs associated with it. And so, you know, wanting um, or expressing the want for differentiated resources to meet some of those different needs. Um, there is a perception, and it was a small perception that no particular attention is paid to climate. It is sort of the, um, you know, the the afterthought, if you will, um, but we know that that's you know certainly not not the intent, um, and and our focus on SEL certainly helps to build um, build up school climate. And then there was the staff express a perception that they're discouraged from discussing climate or differentiated buildings needs. Um, but again, when you dive into the data, you'll kind of see some trends um, where that information is coming from. Um, but we have some great um, resources through the Children's Institute to help support our buildings and to give them the tools to, to work on school climate as an area of focus. 
Okay, this next slide represents um, the feedback given to us through the student um, focus groups. And um, just to point out that the focus groups that were held uh, really um, only uh, or, um, had students from the middle school day middle or excuse me the junior high school and the high school level um so just take an ihs um just due to the age and appropriateness for those conversations so um you can see um some of the different feelings that our students had um, and their perceptions of um, what their their life is like here in West Rondequoit. Um, so certainly that feeling of high pressure to achieve and potentially compete with other districts. That was interesting to, to see how that um, came out through our students. We often sometimes I think feel that as adults or staff, but to hear students articulate that was interesting. Um, of course, our um, students in the upper grades are concerned about, um, you know, how does their their transcript and the different things that they're doing in college or career, like many high school students. Um, this particular focus group didn't have strong concerns about the alcohol or drug use um, at either school. They expressed some concerns on bullying at the junior high, and um, they felt that they were in general supported um, to find an adult within their building um, for help when they're in need. So I think those are some of the, the most important perceptions we can key into. Parent perceptions um, paralleled and underscored many of the staff and student perceptions. Overall, there's general approval of the district. There's interest in social emotional learning and, and no barriers to um, uh, pursuing it as a, an area of focus were identified. Um, this and this was interesting, you know, that that uh, family members could identify, you know, there certainly are resources that the district can offer in support of social emotional learning, but they couldn't identify what those resources specifically were. And so that that um, is certainly some great information for us about how to better meet the needs of parents and to provide information to them um, in a very accessible way. So um, at the end of their report, Children's Institute, um, based on the surveys and focus groups, puts together some final recommendations. Um, as, as you'll see, they've given us seven, which um, we'll get into in a minute, but we feel like some of these we've already luckily um, started to, to undertake and some will continue to develop. Um, but you can see their recommendations range from establishing a district-wide team to develop that vision and action plan, going back to the first slides, about that clear vision and definition of SEL. Um, they recommended training for all staff members, which um, we'll talk a little bit about on our next slide. Uh, evaluate the staff allocation based on needs at different buildings. Uh, also, and, and again, as you read deeper into um, the full report, you'll see that certainly different buildings um, had different um, survey results and, and information. So actively address school climate at more challenging buildings. Uh, look at the different strategies we could potentially develop specifically around culturally responsive education and equity. Uh, ensure restorative practices work and how that is intentionally aligned to SEL. So again, making those connections for both ourselves and for teachers and parents and children. And um, one of the other uh, recommendations, again, as, you'll, as you dive deeper into the full report, you'll see that um, we're a little bit unique in our district as far as um, our transitions and that we have one more transition from third to fourth grade than most districts typically have. Um, and so parents were very um, vocal about that being something they would like continue support in and um, different ways to help um, with that extra transition. So those recommendations really do represent a continuum of, of tasks that, that lie ahead for us. There are some great um, um, steps that we've, we've taken along the way that we just wanted to, um, to mention tonight, knowing that the survey and the focus groups happened in November, the report, we could anticipate some of the results of the report and, and we're starting to work on some of these areas. So it's really 
nice how it all has come together. Um, we have formed our district-wide committee. We had one meeting prior to the closure, and unfortunately, um, one of our uh, our second meeting where we really were going to dive into starting the visioning process um, was um, interrupted. However, we do have a virtual meeting um, set up for next week to bring members of the committee together to um, share these results with them and and to continue that ongoing work and and do this you know in the, in the virtual setting. So um, that work will continue. Um, we form partnerships with a few important organizations um, and deepen some of those existing partnerships that we did have. Uh, PERI or Partners in Restorative Initiatives have come in to do some um, initial training on community building circles. We have our first group or cadre of, of um, educators that have gone through that three-day training and um, starting uh, in the next few weeks, we'll do a train the trainer. And so now in every one of our buildings, we will have folks that are trained in this initial level of restorative practice. And our administrative staff will be going through a restorative discipline training as well using Zoom and, and in this virtual setting so that we can begin some of that, um, some of that work and some of that practice. The Children's Institute itself has been a great resource. Um, we've um, really um, learned a lot from them and building um, uh, coalitions of the willing, you know, uh, across other districts and being able to network and see what kinds of programs and things are working in other districts. They fostered that work. And the Resilience Collaborative. Um, we um, had a small group that were really um, bearing the brunt of the Reaching Teens Toolkit and how to um, implement some of those resilient pra resiliency practices um, across their setting. And so we've um, uh, joined that work and are starting to take up some of that, that heavy lift too. So that can be implemented more consistently across the district. So as um, mentioned, we do have the full uh, report for you in board docs. So um, as you dive into it, if you have questions, um, you can contact either one of us. Um, we're happy to you know, answer anything that, uh, any questions that you may have. Um, do you have any questions for our presentation tonight? Any um, questions from the board? Actually, I do have a question or maybe more of a comment too. Um, I found it interesting um, that 60% of custodial clerical food service transportation felt that SEL should be central. So I was wondering if we're making sure um, to include um, that part of our, our staff because they are so integral to the climate of our, our, our day and our schools um, from the time that they get on to the bus in the morning to the time they uh, get on the bus to go home. So uh, I'm hoping that that's a, a, a part of this as well. Absolutely. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Mr. Bay, can I just chime in? Sure. I'll, I'll make it brief, but, uh, you know, I think uh, today I just want to mention we had a conversation with our principals and one principal had made a comment about soft skills and, um, and uh, some feedback from a, from a parent just around the nature of this pandemic and what it's being, what's being asked of ourselves and our students and our families. And so, you know, as we, as we launch more deeply into this social emotional learning, I think that's an important aspect of this that we've recognized as a district. And again, I compliment Karen and Chrissy for this. This year, we set a target to build student independence. And I think that as, you know, as you're presented with these unexpected challenges, this type of work uh, helps us to build a more resist, resilient, um, balanced, and um, uh, uh, just a, 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 a better prepared, well-rounded individual uh, to manage these types of things. And so um, I just wanna compliment them on their work for that. And then I just wanna, if you get a quick moment, I wanna go back and uh, clean up uh, my apologies for the, <clears throat> I was a little discombob discombobulated during my comments with a, some different things going on here in my computer and 
working through some technology, but I just want to stress with the grading, and I'm going to take this opportunity to do that. Again, complimenting Chrissy and Karen with that. The whole gist of that was the fact that they really listened to our students and our families, um, and they involved them in the process. And the point that I wanted to stress to the board and the community was the fact that at the lower grades, you know, we created this um, platform that's very similar to where kids were at, and we're going to give targeted feedback um, based on the student's progress towards standards. And that's something that families and students are pretty comfortable with because that is very close to our past practice. But at the upper grade levels, um, we noted the fact that for those students um, on their four-year path uh, towards graduation in oftentimes college, uh, per but perhaps career, uh, that um, having those designations as far as their achievement levels was very important to those students and their progress. When we're talking about GPAs and some other factors um, when, they're, when they're applying to those institutions. So again, when you dive into that, if you have any questions, we can answer that. But I wanna again, just call that to the board's attention, to the public's attention. And I think that's different than some other school districts. And so I just wanna compliment them on that work. Okay, thank you, Dr. Johnson. Okay, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is report of leadership staff from our business area. And uh, we'll start out with, uh, I'll turn this over to Dr. Johnson again. Yep, <clears throat> so uh, we'll start with the audit committee. Um, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Brennan. I don't believe we have an update, but I'll check with him. Uh, it's just a quick verbal update. Um, I just wanna let the board know that uh, we are working remotely with our uh, internal auditor, Jim Buffum, who is currently uh, engaged in a risk assessment, our annual risk assessment. Um, he's been conducting phone interviews and uh, we're providing documents to him electronically to complete that task. And uh, we hope to have a draft report by the end of the month and that will um, assist us with scheduling our next audit committee meeting. So um, stay tuned on that, but I just wanna give that brief update. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is facilities planning, Dr. Johnson. Yes, sir. So we do have an update here uh, regarding the renewal project. So Mr. Brennan, would you like to cast that or would you like me to? I can do it if you don't mind. Okay. Um, if you can give me rights. Oh, well, Mr. Brennan. Let me just cast that. How's that? Yep, go ahead. <laughs> I was prepared to do that here, so uh, we'll go ahead and do that. Okay, sir. Awesome. So um, this is just an update. Uh, this takes us through the um, end of March uh, for the renewal project, as we know from some board action um, taken at the last meeting. Um, the renewal project is continuing to progress forwards. Of course, just like um, other areas of the state, um, we are being careful with our contractors in terms of uh, crew allocations and uh, how we're utilizing them so that we're ensuring that there is uh, good social distancing as well as uh, proper uh, disinfecting of areas after they're done. So the uh, renewal project itself, um, from a budget perspective, it's still in a strong position. It, just remember the original referendum um, was $9.6 million. We awarded, um, the board awarded about just under $7.8 million in contracts in the, um, in the summer. Uh, kind of coming into it, we had a construct, construction contingency budget of 197,000 and there's a DASNY piece that's related to borrowing, which we haven't engaged in yet. Um, so that's a, a uh, possible expense tied to future borrowing, but that's kind of all tied to um, working with our fiscal advisors, Bernie Dudigan's office, and looking at bond rates when we get there, but borrowing won't occur until the summertime. So it's more of a placeholder for now. Um, just kind of a status update. Uh, you can actually see that the uh, construction contingency has increased to $339,000, and that's tied to um, some value engineering uh, working with our contractors. Um, but you can see we've uh, completed about 26% of the project. We haven't expended any contingency budget yet. And so we are in a, in a very strong position thus far with uh, the budget side of the uh, renewal project. 
um, kind of work that's been done. You can see through March um, at Dake, we've been really uh, focused in on our uh, working in the bathrooms, the renovations there at the high school. Similarly, um, working at, continue to work through those uh, stacks of bathrooms, um, kind of cent center around our core there. Um, they've engaged in some locker room de demolition, uh, which is a part of the project as well. And then obviously a huge part of the project itself is a quite a bit of roof um, replacement. So people may have seen some contractors up on the roof at the rear of the building, really tied to the areas over our uh, technology wing, but also the cafeteria as well. Um, those were some of the most problematic parts of our roof. So we started there, but there is actually a significant amount more work, roof work that continues uh, through the spring and into summer as well. Uh, kind of where we're going to be in terms of for the, the current month. Uh, now we're getting some tile work in the Dake bathrooms. Uh, high school, there's, remember, there's four different columns of bathrooms. So that it's going to be, you'll see somewhat repetitive month to month in terms of that progress. They just kind of continue to work around. Uh, taking a, a stack of bathrooms offline at a time, do the dem demo, uh, replace a lot of the plumbing, and then rebuild with bathroom tile. Uh, you can also see now they're starting to get into some uh, renovation work of the locker room since they've completed the demolition, and that's more of uh, uh, plumbing and electrical roughing. And we're also uh, utilizing this time to uh, address our last two uh, playgrounds. Uh, remember, we were um, we had identified um, those. Uh, Playgrounds in terms of needing replacement based on their condition. And so we're taking advantage of um, some opportunities now to uh, finish up those two uh, playground replacements. Uh, you can kind of see the submittal process from the uh, architects to the contractors that's ongoing. And we do have uh, consistent meetings ongoing throughout the process. Uh, a lot of it's done through our construction manager campus uh, management, but we also have our uh, owners, operators, uh, architects, and, uh, and construction manager meeting monthly as well. And these are just some pictures, so you can kind of see that um, this is where they are relative to the tile work in the uh, high school restrooms. It's not complete yet. We haven't installed partitions and those types of pieces, but quite a bit of work has been done in terms of the plumbing and the tile work. Uh, you can see the progress in terms of, this is kind of an earlier picture in terms of the next stack. So you can see they uh, have uh, completed demolition. They started the tile work on the floors. They, you can see some new plumbing there in the corners. And so that's uh, continuing to work through. This is up on the third floor of the high school. This takes us to the roof work I was talking about, really located on the um, east and south sides of the buildings. That's over the tech wing, but they're also doing work over our, our um, of our cafeteria as well. And this is the uh, demolition that's occurring at the Colbert playground. And that's uh, it for the project itself. If there are any questions regarding its progress, I'd be glad to try to answer them. James, I had a quick question. Uh, since we're ahead on the contingency budget, if there's money left over, where does that go? The capital reserve or somewhere else? Actually, if you remember back, that's a great question, Matt. Um, the, the, there were several alternates um, that were not awarded. So kind of coming into the bidding process, just because in terms of the prices that we were tracking in terms of all the work out there on, I'll use campus's word, on the streets, um, they, uh, they were anticipating bids coming in higher than when the project was conceived over a year prior. And so uh, they did some work with um, identifying potential alternates and kind of remove them from the main portion of the project. Um, that way we could, it, it, in, essence, in, in essence, protect the bid so we could award and move on with the major portions of the project. And then as we get to further along, like you're suggesting now, um, we'll, we have a better idea of where we are with that contingency and then we can award some of those bids. So those, some of those um, alternates included, you know, some additional work in terms of some concrete work at the Day Plaza. Um, there were some areas in terms of uh, some flooring at Sproul Fieldhouse and a number of places that um, the uh, facilities planning committee is reviewing now. But we're getting closer because, you know, one of the bigger milestones actually was two areas: the the bathrooms themselves. And then also the locker rooms, which we described, because a lot of the contingency money is really set around things you can't see. So when you 
you know, when you break open a wall, you know, even though we've had these buildings for a long time, they've undergone a lot of different renovations, and iterations. So until you actually get in behind the wall, you don't know what's there necessarily. And, and that tends to be where your contingency money is going. But if you can see the progress we've done, uh, we're in a pretty strong position and getting close to the part of identifying those um, areas which we bring to the board because the board would need to award those uh, alternates. Thank you. You're welcome. Any I other questions? Oh, go ahead, Mr. Yeah. Long. I just wanted to offer a thanks um, just with the communication about some of the projects going on, um, especially the, play, the playground, the fence went up and I know that there was questions about, you know, was this social distancing or, or what, but I saw just quick work and very good work about explaining what was going on and why. So I just wanted to say thanks about for that. You're welcome. Okay, anybody else? Okay, we'll move on to our next item on the agenda. The next item on the agenda is report of our leadership staff in our personnel area. I'll turn this over to Dr. Johnson. Oh, actually, Ms. Kelly, can I have a resolution please first? The recommended resolution is, be it resolved that the personnel agenda dated April 16, 2020, as recommended by the superintendent of schools be approved as presented. Motion please. Thank you, Ms. Cunningham. Second, please. I'll second. Thank you, Dr. Steckley. Okay, with that, now I'll move to Dr. Johnson. Sorry about that, Dr. Johnson. Okay, Mr. Bay. It, um, I don't have anything specifically to add, but I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Hunter if he has some comments regarding the agenda. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Um, during the superintendent's report, Dr. Johnson spoke very nicely to the work uh, that um, he and James Brennan and our Union uh, unions have done to put together our memorandums of agreement regarding continuous instruction. We feel very good about this work being accomplished. And that's the primary piece that uh, I wanted to make sure uh, I support. Thank you. Okay. Move on to the next item on the agenda. Any, well, first of all, any questions from the board? Got a vote, right, Ms. Kelly? Please. She's get, she was getting nervous there. <laughs> I did. <laughs> uh, any questions from the board first? I'm sorry. Okay, none being had. We're going to go ahead and vote on this. All those in favor, say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. I'm Ms. Kelly. I see uh, seven zero. Okay, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is new business. We're going to start out in the first three parts of new business. Um, as the agenda states, it will be approval. Um, this is a procedural vote uh, since we are part of the Monroe County One's BOCES uh, system. Um, each uh, Board of Education appoints one member to uh, Monroe County One BOCES to serve on that board, and it's on a three year term rotating basis. So this year we have three members. These are members that are appointed, uh, recommended by the uh, Home District uh, Board of Education. They are brought to each board to vote on for approval. Um, we have resumes from each one of them. Each one's in a separate resolution. So I'll have Ms. Kelly read those. The three districts are Honeyoy Falls, Lima, Penfield, and Pittsford. So we'll start with the first one. Ms. Kelly, can I have a resolution for the first item on the agenda? The recommended resolution is be it resolved to cast one vote for the election of Christine DeTurk, resident of Honeyoy Falls and Lima Central School District, as a member of the Monroe Number no. 1 BOCES Board of Education for a term of office which will begin on July 1, 2020 and end on June 30, 2023. I'll Motion, move it. please. Thank you, Dr. Steckley. Oh. Second, please. Thank you, Mr. Metris. Okay, uh, Dr. Johnson, is there anything you would like to say about these? I know the board has had a chance to read each of their resumes. Would you like to comment on each one or do you want us to go ahead and vote? Uh, Mr. Bay, I don't have any additional comments at this time. Okay, is there any questions from the board on this candidate? Again, they've been fully vetted by their home board. So we'll go ahead and vote on that. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Ms. Kelly, that looks like 7-0. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next item. Uh, with the next resolution, Ms. Kelly, can I have that one, please? The recommended resolution is, be it resolved to cast one vote for the election of Lisa Latin, resident of Penfield Central School District, as a member of Monroe Number no. 1 BOCES Board of Education for a term of office, which will begin July 1, 2020 and end on June 30, 
2023. Motion, please. Move. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Second, please. Second, second. Thank you, Mr. Long. Okay, again, any questions on this candidate? Again, we've had a chance to reserve the resume. Resume, excuse me. Dr. Johnson, nothing to add, as you said before. So we'll go ahead and vote on this. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ms. Kelly, that's aye. again, seven zero. Okay, we'll move on to the third one, Ms. Kelly. The recommended resolution is be it resolved to cast one vote for the election of Kim McCluskey, resident of Pittsburgh Central School District, as a member of the Monroe Number no. 1 BOCES Board of Education for a term of office, which will begin July 1, 2020, and end on June 30, 2022. So this just so, yeah, uh, can I motion, please? I'll move it. Thank you, Ms. Dr. Stuckley, second, please. Thank you, Mr. Metris. So this one is only for two years. This is to, uh, as the note says, this is to fill a seat that was vacated by the former uh, sitting board member, and then she will have to run again in 2022. So uh, any questions from the board? And a well-qualified candidate, we'll go ahead and vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ms. Kelly, that's 7-0. Okay. okay. Just check these off. I want to keep my spot here. Approval of the uh, next item on the agenda, which will be approval of the 2020 budget. Resolution, please. The recommended resolution is be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Western Underpoint Central School District votes to approve the proposed BOCES administrative budget in the amount of $5,618,285 for the 2020-2021 fiscal year. I'm all of that. Motion, please. And Ms. Cunningham, please. Mr. Fink, thank you. Okay, we're going to turn this uh, resolutions on the table. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Bay. Uh, I had a chance to go through this. It looks like a very fair budget that they put together. Um, I didn't find anything in particular that I would have a comment on. I would ask Mr. Brennan um, from his perspective as a business official if he has anything to add. Um, I'll just add just more from a process perspective. Um, you know, they, they do review this um, budget at a variety of levels. Um, one, one at the business officials level, we uh, get a chance to ask questions and uh, understand, you know, the cost challenges they face just like we do. Um, but I, I agree with exactly what Dr. Johnson said. It, they take a very fair approach. Um, they recognize that um, the component districts um, always face um, uh, fiscal challenges and they take that into account when they develop their budgets. Any other questions from the board? James, do they receive uh, funding straight from the state in the possibility of having that removed? Is that gonna impact this budget at all and change it at some point? They get their aid from their component districts themselves. So that's where the budget, so basically they, this is what that's being approved right now. Um, and then the individual services uh, we sign up for provide additional revenues as well. James, um, I just have, oh, go ahead, Dr. Stackley, go ahead. Uh, just one of the things I had noticed was the, um, in terms of the tuition increases, that um, there was one that was by, increased by 20%, which was really different from the others. Did you have any, um, it was, I think it was O'Connor Academy. Any idea why that one was so different from the others? Um, those fluctuations are tied to, you know, enrollments and class sizes as they work through those pieces. Um, and you do see those, you know, sometimes they are building in um, some contingencies into those budgets, but on the back end of it, um, you know, they, their goal is always to make sure that their, um, their individual programs are revenue neutral. Um, and so that's how they develop those, those budgets themselves. But on the back end, if there ever are um, monies remaining within those programs, so it's kind of interesting, their budget is like a, it's like a system, a whole bunch of little budgets put together. Um, because they have both each program has its own revenue going into it from the form of you know people having students go there and then the expenses in terms of the, the payments. So 
all of those individual budgets get resolved at the end of the year. And if there's any remaining monies left, those get returned to the component districts in the amount that which they signed up for. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's their approach. It works really well. Um, so even when you see an increase in that, that's just probably, that's more tied to a personnel adjustments within there as well. Um, but they aren't necessarily just, um, just trying to build up funds. It's, it's reflective of the programs themselves. Okay, thank you. And James, can I just ask a question? And I, I didn't go back and look at this. Do we know how much of an increase this budget was from over last year? Um, I believe they were, I believe it's about a 3% increase is what their parameters they're working under when they develop that budget overall. It, there will be some individual fluctuations and then each individual district's, you know, flavor of that will be a little different. Like Meg's question around the program that was growing more than that, if we have a number of students going there, that would reflect ours. But overall, it's about a 3% increase um, for their budget. And, and they are not subject to like the property tax cap? Yep, they are not subject to a property tax cap because their funds come from the component districts. But we are, so really they kind of are, but not really. Correct. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions from the board? Okay, none being had, we're gonna go ahead and vote on uh, the 2020-2021 BOCES budget. All those in favor say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. Ms. Kelly, that's seven zero. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next item on the agenda, which is approval of a tax certiorari settlement. Can I have the resolution first, Ms. Kelly? Yes, the recommended resolution is, whereas HD Development of Maryland Inc. in care of Home Depot, number 1273 Home Depot, filed tax cert proceedings challenging the assessment on its property located at 1111 East Ridge Road in the town of Arundacoit for the 2018-19 and 2019-20 tax years. And whereas Home Depot has proposed settlement of the proceedings by reducing the assessment to 6,200,000 and whereas the town of Arundacoit supports the settlement proposal and whereas the Board of Education is willing to settle the proceedings pursuant to the terms outlined above. Now, therefore, be it resolved that, number one, the Board of Education agrees to settle the tax cert proceedings commenced by Home Depot in accordance with the terms set forth above and in the form approved by Ferrara Forenza PC and hereby delegates to Ferrara Forenza PC the authority to execute such settlement documents and two, the resolution shall take effect immediately. I have a motion, please. So moved. Is that Mr. Metris? Yes, it is, sir. I'll and second. A second. Thank I'll you. Second. That, that's Dr. Steckley. Thank you. Sorry, I switched over to the other screen to get the totals. Um, okay, we're going to start with this. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Johnson. If there's any um, you would like to add before we go ahead and ask for board member questions. Mr. Bay, I, I don't have anything to add, but I know Mr. Brenna has been working um, on this with our attorneys over the course of the, the two years here, <clears throat> going on three. So, Mr. Brennan, anything that you would add specifically? Um, just a reminder, you know, we work with Ferrar and Fiorenza in terms of the our tax um, certiorari proceedings. Um, it's really a way of being efficient and the fact they also represent East Arondicoit. And as we know, you know, both districts are located within the town of Arondicoit. Um, they do a great job of representing us in these cases, and uh, put a lot of value in their recommendations towards um, any settlements as they come up. The other advantage of utilizing them is it keeps us more abreast in terms of those how these are proceeding. Because as you can tell, you know this is a two-year one, but sometimes these take four, five, six years to settle, and it, it, it's quite helpful to me in terms of knowing where we are in terms of that progress. Um, so I would recommend this. Uh, uh, the settlement as, as pr proposed. Okay, thank you, Mr. Brennan. Questions or comments from the board? Okay, so just a couple comments I'll have is, these are um, budgeted for J, correct in our very uh, reserve, which we have. Um, and so we, this is a two year settlement at home, total settlement was 18,000. 
1,048 and some change with uh, about 89, 39 from 1820 or 1819 and 9, 9, 9209 from 1920. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Money we have in our tax surgery reserve, so it doesn't affect the operating budget of the district. That's correct as well. Okay, and can you just tell me was the was this less than the amount that the original filing was for? Yes. So uh, if you kind of on the um, attachment, it it actually yeah. gives the amount that they were potentially due under the uh, their petitions themselves. So the petitions were for approximately thirty thousand dollars, and that's the amount we had reserved for these particular um, challenges. And so we are going to uh, yield about there's been eleven thousand uh, dollar difference between the two in terms of what we what we have settled with versus the uh, full petition amounts. Okay, so I just want everybody to understand that that are, is watching. So that is that's again that's uh, prudent budgeting by your office of making sure that we have the full amount in the reserve, and it's easier to back it out than to have to put it back in later on because they can uh, throw our budget on a whack. So thank you for your diligence on uh, making sure that that reserve is fully funded for when we do have settlements on these cases. Correct, thank you very much. Okay, any other questions from the board? None being had, we'll go ahead and vote. All those in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 Ms. Kelly, that looks like 7-0 to execute that agreement. Okay, we'll move on to the next item on the uh, agenda, which is a CICRA resolution for the Seneca Roof Project. Uh, we're going to start with a Ms. Kelly reading a resolution. The recommended resolution is, whereas the West Arundelwood Central School District Board of Education, the board, has considered the impacts to the environment of the following scope of work to be completed at Seneca Elementary School roof replacement. Whereas the Board of Education has reviewed the proposed action with respect to the type two criteria set forth in section six of the NYCRR part 617, the State Environmental Quality Review Act, CECRA, and concluded that the project involves maintenance and repairs involving no substantial changes to the existing facilities or structures in section 617.5C1. Therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Education, number one, the proposed action does not constitute substantial changes to the existing facilities and therefore do not exceed the threshold established under Section 6 of the NYCRR Part 617 or the State Environmental Quality Review Act for a Type 2 action. Two, the Board hereby determines the proposed action as is a Type 2 action in accordance with the secret regulations. Three, no further review of the proposed action is required under CEPRA. And four, this resolution shall take shall be effective immediately. Thank you. Motion, please. Thank you, Mr. Fink. Second, please. I'll second it. Thank you, Ms. Cunningham. Okay, I'll turn this over to Dr. Johnson before we have questions from the board. Thank you, Mr. Bay. <clears throat> so as you may recall, the Seneca roof um, is what we have proposed within the 2021 um, budget uh, as far as our capital outlay or what we call it uh, locally, the 100K project. Um, and so this is in preparation for submitting that project if the board approves that budget and if the voters approve that budget, um, this would allow us to start that in a timely manner and have that replaced. Um, I think, and Mr. Brennan can chime in, but I think that that would be done before the fall. Is that correct, Mr. Brennan? That's, that's correct, Dr. Johnson. We're gonna be targeting the summertime for that work. Yep, and, um, and uh, we feel like this is an extremely fair price for this. And I would remind folks that the, the benefit of the 100K project and including that every year in our annual budget is that once you start that sequence, you're able to do $100,000 worth of work at basically 20% of the, the cost. But with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Brennan. Do you want to add some comments on that? 
Uh, just, I'm just going to quick highlights on this resolution itself. Um, this is a requirement, as Dr. Johnson mentioned, as part of that uh, application process in New York State. Um, the important, most important parts to recognize with this, this is a maintenance project. Um, so it's more of a, a procedural piece. You know, if we were making significant alterations to the footprint of the building itself, where there could be an environmental impact from those alterations, then it possibly could result in a more um, involved um, environmental quality review for us. Um, but just to give you an example, even when we added onto the uh, K-3 buildings with those kindergarten classrooms, even that did not um, constitute a large enough change in terms of the overall structure itself to move it from a type two to a type one. Type two though, um, very typical, just like stated in the resolution itself, maintenance type work that doesn't change the uh, nature of the building or its surrounding areas at all. Okay. Anything else, Dr. Johnson? Not at this time. Thank you, Mr. Bay. Okay. We'll take questions and comments from the board at this time. None being had. I just have one question, James. Um, since Seneca is uh, consider considered a historic building, and this is a roof replacement. I know we talked about it in facilities. I just want everybody else to understand that that was taken into, into account when the uh, project was looked at, correct? That's correct. They went down that uh, looked um, contact with SHPO in terms of the application process. Yep. Just want to make sure everybody understood that, that even uh, that was done also. So thank you. Okay. I don't think there's any other questions on this. So we're going to Go ahead and vote on this uh, action. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Raise your hand, Ms. Kelly, that's seven zero. We're gonna move on to the next item on the agenda, which is strategic planning discussion. I'll turn this over to Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Vay. <clears throat> so I think the last time that we had a conversation about strategic planning, um, I had uh, shared with the board that there was a proposed uh, contract from the Warner School and um, we had a presentation from uh, Lynn Ertle, a retired superintendent from Canandaigua, uh, regarding that process of strategic planning. Uh, and uh, we were taking a look at the cost of that, of that project, uh, understanding that it's, its importance and relevance uh, to our work and um, our mission and vision moving forward. And so the board had asked me to go back and have a conversation um, with Warner School and Ms. Ertle about the, that cost and see if there's ways, given the, the financial landscape um, that we're currently in and um, the forecast for the future, uh, if there's any way that we could do that in a more cost-effective manner. Uh, and so over the last week or so, I've been going back and forth uh, and uh, Ms. Ertle had, she uh, received approval from Warner School to reduce the cost about give or take $3,000 off the top for some of their fees. And then we comb through that and working with Mr. Brennan because we have some really solid structures in place and some committees that have been working on some specific areas, um, specifically uh, our financial planning. And then also our facilities planning, which we just talked about with the Seneca roof. We felt confident in the work that we're doing internally to inform that process. So we're able to shave uh, some costs off related to those. And so all told, we've been able to reduce the cost. Um, it's going to be probably around eight to $10,000. Uh, she's working on a final contract. It could be around that $10,000, but she wanted to take a chance to uh, a moment to go back and talk with the folks at Warner School to finalize that. So my purpose in bringing this back to the board today is A, to just follow up on the conversation and B, to uh, open up the floor for some discussions as far as how the board would like to proceed. Okay. Floor is open for board members. Questions, is, um, comments? So Dr. Johnson, does that represent a change in the scope of work they're gonna be doing? Um, Cause I know she presented kind of alternatives for sort of the deluxe and the less deluxe, or am I? Yep, um, it doesn't change the scope. Um, what it does is it's going to lean on our internal processes around uh, the financial uh, planning and the forecasting there. So rather than reviewing our documents and materials, we're going to be providing information 
around that to inform our strategic planning moving forward for, for the financial piece and also for facilities. Um, it does still include the, um, the comparables that we talked about. So that would be another way to reduce the cost if the board would like to do so. Um, and that's a change that we can make, you know, between now and when we finalize that contract. Uh, what we have done working with James and just uh, taking a look at some of what we're going to get into later on tonight uh, regarding the budget update. Um, we put some things on hold to free up uh, some, some more funds to support this project. Just again, looking at the priorities and understanding that this is really, really will define the core of our work. And as we're talking about initiatives uh, moving forward um, and really having that, that, that firm guidance, which is um, rooted in our data and, um, and the feedback and input from our stakeholders, uh, I think that this is, is, in my opinion as a superintendent, is pretty critical. Um, so we did right now put on hold our safety and security audit to free up some funds. And the reason we did that, um, well, there's two reasons. Number one was that uh, to, to execute that with fidelity, um, it requires the students and staff to be in session so that they can watch our routines and our practices uh, relative to safety and security of our buildings. And we're not, e not able to do that right now. And then secondly, um, we uh, made some contacts with some folks regionally and we identified some other potential vendors. And if we open that back up for another um, request for proposals, uh, we feel that um, maybe there would be an advantage in that. And so we're gonna table that. And I would just remind folks, both the Board of Education and the folks at home, that this is something that's aidable through BOCES. So again, Mr. Brennan, 78%, return on that the following year, getting the thumbs up. So um, it would be a cost this year, but the net cost, because it does generate a revenue next year, would be, um, the net cost would be 22%. Okay, other questions from the board? I would just offer that, that I'm, I mean, I'm supportive of this work and I appreciate Aaron, you uh, going back and Kind of not not dealing, but um, making sure that we're, I guess, making the best fiscally sound and also um, worthwhile plan to to consider. So thanks for doing that. Yeah, and Dr. Johnson, I'll just add, you know, thanks for the for your uh, comments on on the whole scope of this and, and really looking at it. But it, you know, the plan for um, district office with the well, we had the security uh, risk assessment planned and not being able to uh, fully um, do a deep dive on that without an in session, it makes sense that we could shift some of the funds over here and get that money. Again, we know it'll be coming back next year to, to hopefully do that security audit when we're in full session. Um, so again, I think it's wise use of the, the uh, money um, for the fact is this will really be a plan that will help lay the foundation for really the next five years, correct, Dr. Johnson? That's correct, Mr. Bay. So it's an important work that we need to be doing. So again, thank you everybody for that. And we look forward to uh, you bringing back uh, more information to the board at a later date. Okay. Okay, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which was the item added, item eight, which will do a budget update. I'll turn this over to Dr. Johnson. Yes, and Mr. Uh, Brennan, I'm going to turn it over to you, and I did grant you access there uh, to be able to cast your uh, presentation, and, and I apologize to the board. We were working on finalizing this uh, right up until earlier today to make sure that, um, that we did our due diligence, and again, before we launch this, I just want to thank uh, folks appropriately. Um, as you know, we're facing uh, a substantial gap in our budget this year at $873,000 and some change. Um, and so it really required us to sharpen our pencils um, and work collaboratively and, and um, really an, in, an intelligent and, um, and uh, focused way to find 
uh, some ways that we could reduce our budget um, that were farthest away from our classroom and instruction and core programs and services for our students. And I think we did that. So uh, Mr. Brennan, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Dr. Johnson. And I'm just going to bring up the presentation itself. And can everybody see that okay? Great. Okay, so uh, this is an update on the uh, on our budget. Uh, we've had several, um, obviously, iterations of developing the budget. And as Dr. Johnson indicated, um, where we left it two weeks ago, we were um, essentially in a deficit for our budget of about $873,000. So our goal over the last two weeks was to bring the budget back into balance. Um, so yes, we did have a gap, um, both in terms of from, mostly from the revenue side of the budget tied to um, lack of state aid, um, mostly from foundation aid being frozen at the current year's level. Um, that resulted in this, uh, this uh, significant gap. Um, and just remember, you know, sometimes I, I get questions from people, you know, why do you have to bring into balance necessarily? Well, you know, it's kind of the difference in terms of government and uh, agencies. And so unlike, essentially, unlike the federal government, school districts can't develop a budget that's in a deficit. Um, so we need to balance the revenues and expenses. And so essentially to accomplish that, you either need to increase your revenues, decrease your expenses, or do some combination of the two. And it's actually that final piece is where we landed. Um, again, towards the goal that Dr. Johnson talked about is to minimize the impact on the classroom. Um, so it really took kind of a multi-phase approach to it so that no one single area really got hammered. We did kind of lean on this, um, hierarchy that uh, Dr. Johnson and I had developed um, as we were kind of, uh, we realized, you know, going into, you know, watching news conferences of the governor, we recognized we were going to be faced with some definite challenges this year uh, tied to the uh, COVID-19 um, pandemic. So we kind of developed this hierarchy in advance and we definitely leaned on in this process. Um, and I know we went through this uh, last week, uh, two weeks ago, sorry, with the board in terms of our prioritization. Um, you know, the color changes are really tied to overall fiscal health of the district moving forwards. So the ones in green um, would have probably you know, the most long, long term um, where the other ones are not. James? Yes. I think you just need to refresh your screen every time you change a slide because we're still on the first slide. Okay. Thank you. How about I go to this, this slide deck instead? There you go. Okay. We'll stay here. <laughs> So, um, and I appreciate you uh, the point how it kept rolling. <laughs> um, so from a revenue side, um, as we, as you know, part of our budget does include um, facility use of our um, fees tied to our facility uses. We actually haven't touched these um, for several years. And so part of our recommendation would be to increase those by 15%. Um, that results in a uh, revenue increase of about, based on kind of uh, current uses of about $12,000. Um, the second one, I'm just gonna take a few minutes to explain it. It's really tied to the um, BOCES capital project. Last year, um, all the component districts on the east side um, approved the, um, the a $22 million uh, Monroe One BOCES project really tied to the modernization of their buildings. It had been a long time since any major capital work had been done. At the end of our last year's budget, our 18-19 um, budget, we had set aside um, some monies towards that first payment. Um, we're required to, our share of that $22 million is about $1.8 million. And, and that's gonna be paid in three, over three years um, on some various payments. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to realize aid in our next year's budget as we pay for that. Um, this is a little bit different than typical aid, BOCES aid. You, you know, as we all know, BOCES aid, you typically get back the next year. But actually, unlike that, when you deal with a capital project um, through BOCES, you actually get the aid back in the same year. So we're going to be realizing some additional revenue that wasn't represented on the governor's runs um, because uh, the project hasn't started yet. 
And so we're anticipating about $134,000 in aid tied to that uh, BOCES capital project um, that's gonna be starting um, in the summer. Um, so that's, that's on the revenue side. So then we kind of, we worked through the expenditure side of the budget. Um, the place where we started was we um, froze uh, building and various department budgets, whether it's operations and maintenance, um, you know, technology as well. We froze them at their uh, current year levels, 2019-20 um, levels. Um, for most of them, it, it really was more of a freeze of their CPI adjustment around 2% increases. Um, some of these um, larger amounts were some bigger asks that they were involved in, um, in terms of their budget development, but that all told uh, yielded a savings of about $105,000. In addition to that, we're going to be reducing our travel and conference budgets um, district-wide by about $22,000. And then we also, as a district, we also engage in a variety of contractual services. Um, and that uh, part of that, for an example, would be the um, example that Dr. Johnson just talked about for our security audit that we're going to be postponing. Um, so that's represented that number as well. Um, so that represents another $73,000. And then we're looking at um, so a few different BOCES services reductions in terms of uh, what we had initially planned for um, back in February. Um, we're looking to get, uh, yield a total of about $151,000 um, from those. So these are all kind of tied to non-personnel side of our budget. Um, then from a uh, personnel side of our budget, uh, we're looking at some different areas. So one is really just an adjustment in terms of where our enrollment was when we developed our initial budget to where our enrollment is now. So we're able to uh, shave off um, some sections here and there. Uh, this was some great work done with uh, Karen Finter, Chrissy Miga, and uh, Dr. Hunter in terms of identifying um, some pieces that didn't necessarily need to be there. They were just based on some earlier um, enrollment projections that we believe we're able to refine a little bit more. So it's about $47,000. Um, we are also looking to um, uh, reduce our use of overtime in the next budget for a total as a target of about $30,000. Um, the biggest piece on this section is really freezing any new hires we had planned on um, uh, adding to our uh, roles, but also um, we're looking at some retirements and uh, using attrition. In other words, not filling those positions um, that would yield in terms of a savings in both in terms of salaries and benefits of about $230,000. Uh, we're making some adjustments in terms of uh, some special assignments and additional duties that we pay stipends and uh, some summer work days on. Um, so that would result in an additional savings of about $40,000, $40,500. And then finally, um, we're making, work again, working closely with uh, Karen and Chrissy, uh, some reductions in summer professional development um, some curriculum work in our labs, uh, reducing the number of days available through that for a total of about $33,000. So all told, um, both from a revenue and expense side, um, it allowed us to uh, achieve uh, that gap and with about six to $7,000 to spare um, in terms of balancing the budget um, so that we are in balance in terms of moving forwards uh, against that gap. So I'd be glad to answer any questions there are um, regarding any of those uh, adjustments or reductions. I had a quick question, James. On the uh, BOCES reduction, I think it was BOCES services, I think it was. Yep. Yeah, 151,000. What type of services is, uh, does that include? So. Some of those services are tied to our, um, in terms of some of our uh, potential enrollments of CTE, uh, career and tech education slots that are available. We've been looking closely in terms of the number of slots we typically sign up for um, versus how many actually we fill. Um, so there was a, there's a gap between those two. So we're gonna try to cord, better coordinate and tighten that. So that would be an example as, of, of where some of those uh, pieces come in. 
And there are other um, BOCI services tied to various programs that we um, enroll in as well. So that's kind of a targeted number. We're refining some of those BOCI signups. Our final BOCI signups are due in May. And so that's a that's kind of our targeted value for that. So it's not going to be taking away um, opportunities for students that were interested in doing some of those BOCES programs? Uh, we're, again, it'll be working closely with counselors and uh, principals, but again, it's kind of looking at our historic numbers in terms of the initial slots we set aside versus the numbers of students who actually enroll in it. But we're gonna have to refine those numbers as we move forward. So that is a targeted number versus a hard number. Okay, thank you. So yep. James, to follow up on Mr. Fink's question. So I know we, we you talked about the target reduction, but if we were to get an increase in um, students who um, showed an interest in the CTE, um, then the district would, and they went, you know, obviously the, this is a, uh, uh, this process isn't taken lightly. It's done through the counseling center with input from counselors and um, really buy-in from the student about the programs. But if we did have a, a let's just say a class that came through that wanted to have the CTE experience or thought that was right for their um, post high school um, uh, career, um, the district would be able to increase that if needed with BOCES. Is that, is that a correct statement? That is correct. There is some flex within that number um, because it's tied to a larger BOCES budget number of around $6 million. Okay. I just want to make sure that if we did have a large class that showed that interest that we weren't uh, blocking any kids out. So thank you for that clarification. I have one piece to that too, James. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and so James is correct. I mean, there's uh, kind of zooming out on this. There's a number of programs that um, we've been discussing uh, where um, there could potentially be reductions. And so we're targeting this number overall based on um, what we know from our directors and principals. Uh, and one thing that we discovered uh, specific to CTE is that um, in relation to our, uh, the other regional um, high schools in the area, uh, our completion rate uh, for the CTE programs at BOCES is, is significantly lower. And so that's one thing that we want to take a look at as far as our programming. Um, are we making sure that, uh, um, that uh, through the screening process, um, we're matching the students uh, to the best of our abilities with the, with the best fit as far as their four-year plan um, and their college and career trajectory? And so again, you know, this is something that we're going to work within. It's a target. And as James had said, if there's, uh, if there's students that want to gain access and it, it is, you know, their career pathway or they have an interest in that, we're going to make sure that those students have that access. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. James, just one other question. I believe on the, can you go up one more slide? So uh, the facilities use increase of 15%, which is, is a, mar a marginal increase. We, again, we look at our cost of really what it just takes care of to take care of the facilities when our outside organizations use them. Um, so they haven't been, I think six years, was it about James that we haven't increased it about? That's correct. We've never, actually, we've never increased it, but you're right. We started about six years ago. Yeah. So with salaries and, and uh, cost of services going up, that is, it's a probably reflective of a move at this time but my question is is due to the situation we're in now was, was that 12 plus twelve thousand dollars a conservative estimate because i believe we'll we could possibly lose some of our facilities revenue over the summer um if this if it continues in the ratio you know that we're in today um we're seeing that events into the summer are starting to, to cancel um so could you just maybe comment on that yeah, I mean, well, I guess by nature, I am conservative uh, in terms of we the know first that. place. Um, <laughs> but, but also, remember, we, we always try to tie this as much to the expense, too, 
So even if um, the facilities themselves were used less, and you're exactly right, they could be used less this summer, they would also, the, the expense side of the use of those would be less too. So we'd still yield probably the same amount of savings that I'm conservatively projecting. Okay, so you, you, I knew I knew you thought of that somehow. I just didn't know how you were going to explain it to me. <laughs> James, could you could you give an example or two about the you know who are the who who are the facility fees going to be uh, increased for? What are some examples of of who uses our our facilities? Yeah, I mean our our primary um, our primary uses of them. We you know we have we engage first of all with the town of Arondequoit. You know we 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 use services from them and we pay them. They use our facilities and we charge them for them. So a lot of their uh, you know their camps and so on. They um, through their parks and rec program. They're they're uh, significant users. Um, we have you know a variety of different uh, community athletic groups. Both they use outside facilities and indoor facilities as well for that. Um, those are probably I would say if I was categorizing them, they'd probably be also a major uh, user as well. But then you also have some you know small here and there pieces out there. And just to kind of you know you know lay out you know what the cost increase might be, you know just. For example, we will often rent out, you know, a classroom, let's say to somebody, you know, the typical cost would be, you know, $30 it, for the, you know, for an hour's use of that. And so, you know, we're talking, you know, in terms of an increase, it would, it would increase it to by about 15%, you know, to about, you know, 30, 34, $35 in that case. Oh, that's great. Thank you for the help. Yep. Could you just add, um, how long has it been since we've um, taken a look at those fees and adjusted those? Yeah, we've, we actually look at them annually. Um, and we've just really been very careful, you know, because recognizing that we were trying not to impact those various organizations we talked about. And actually, we had an ink. We look at them annually. Um, we've tried to avoid making adjustments in terms of the fees on there. Um, wrecking, you know, basically for the reasons I just stated, but in terms of the, some of the challenges that we're facing right now, we feel like we're justified in terms of essentially some of the subsidization we've done over the last several years um, by not adjusting them. I had a quick follow up. It, it kind of dawned on me while uh, Mr. Vey was talking about potentially not uh, the facilities not being used this summer. On the same uh, uh, topic, like we're not using diesel fuel right now for buses or anything are we realizing any savings by not being open there is there are some savings that are being uh, accumulated you know right now in terms of a, a number of different areas so so one is transportation definitely you know we aren't um, paying our transportation contractors because they aren't using buses um, we're also realizing some savings um, from the perspective of our you know per diem substitutes you know we don't have subs right now. Um, right. The other piece would be, um, you know, there's no real right now. There's there's no overtime use that's occurring. Um, so those pieces as well. Um, so the, yeah, there are some. There's definitely going to be some additional fund balance, uh, more so than usual at the end of this fiscal year. I mean, there are going to be some costs though too. Um, you know, we talked about uh, we talked early on. We thanked our food service workers for all the great work they're doing. You know, breakfasts and lunches, daily totals are running about a thousand, but that's still less than uh, what they normally be serving during the course of uh, a day. So there's definitely going to be some losses from a food service perspective that we're going to have to account for too. But but you're right, it's going to be it's going to be a net it's going to be a net um, surplus just tied to the fact that we aren't um, fully open right now. Would there? Um... Can you get, can you hear me? Sorry, I'm. I can. Yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> would there be are, would there be any savings? Just noting that we're going to be voting on fine paper later. Um, you know things like paper. Um, given that so much work obviously is being done online, so much instruction that we're probably. I mean, does that add up to anything significant, or in, or in turn in turn reduce our orders for next year? Um, well, it, we. There are some. There are going to be some instances where we are going to have to order some things next year um, because of some remaining supplies. We try not to essentially stockpile in advance, um, so there are some. There'll be some monies left as well. You know, probably probably the biggest area I would say in terms of like from a supplies perspective would be our Department of Environmental Services budget right now. I mean, they're engaged. We have we're running essentially a skeletal crew. 
Um, you know, we aren't, you know, we aren't going through a lot of supplies at this point, um, specifically because we're, you know, we're tying like um, building cleaning to where people come in or tied to our food service programs, but a lot of the other remaining of the buildings are remaining idle. So yeah, there's the supplies and equipment side of um, the operations and maintenance budget is another area where there'll be some surplus at the end too. Any other questions? James, if I can just cut in, I know that I received a survey today from State Ed around transportation. We haven't had a chance to talk about that yet, but we have talked about um, some of the question marks around that. And I think it, uh, this would lend itself uh, to explain some of that as far as the expense versus the revenue and how that works around transportation. Oh, so you'd like me to speak to that specifically? Yeah, do you mind? I think yeah, not at all. So, yeah, so transportation is interesting in the fact that um, right now we are, um, we're not, our expenses are very small, um, just tied to basically um, some of our, our staff that are engaged in some next year's uh, route planning. But um, in terms of like contractual side, it's, we basically ceased um, expenses. But Aaron is right in terms of there will be a revenue essentially hit on that side of the budget. Um, I built some of it in um, already um, based on the fact that, remember, transportation is an expense-driven aid. Um, so, so the lack of expense this year will result in a lack of revenue from some of that next year. And so we're going to need to uh, essentially move some of the funds over and from a perspective of appropriate fund balance to cover that revenue gap in there. You know, some of the questions around the state have been, you know, even, even if you did expend it this year, would you be allowed to? Um, because would the state give you aid back on it? Um, so that's been the hesitancy of districts like ourselves in terms of um, actually engaging the expense. And even it's, you know, it even goes to the highest level in terms of the constitution. You know, you're, can you expense money when you're not receiving services back? So those are a number of questions that's out there for the state to answer for school districts. Thank you. Can I just ask another question um, about slide six? Um, I know you talked about, you know, reducing the impact on students, but I can you just say a little bit about, you know, any of these items on this slide and, and what the impact might be on the students? Um, well, I, I, I guess I can go one at a In time. General. So yeah, the first one, it's really, that, that reduction would have been there anyways. Um, this is really just a, you know, kind of we, we have early enrollment projections, we adjust them either up or down um, based on kind of that enrollment projections moving forwards so we see that we just don't need as many sections across the district. So that there, there's really no impact there in terms of program or class size or anything. You know, overtime is really kind of separate from student impact itself. Um, we're just gonna have to be a bit more diligent in terms of uh, approving uses of that. Um, you know, the, the new hires, um, that was more of a flux position in terms of an additional position built into the budget that we're not gonna be um, hiring at this point. That wouldn't have made a, just a, a change in terms of class size, it would have just been a different role. Um, the attrition-based position reductions, it could be. Um, we made some adjustments with that, but it, it, there would be potentially a, for uh, one of the, for a teaching position where it could result in some class sizes um, staying within our original budgeted parameters, but um, it could result in a slight increase in some class sizes there as they develop that master schedule. Um, special assignments, additional duties and assignments. Actually, that was a, a strategy to actually mitigate some of the uh, position reduction above. So that was kind of a strategy in terms of it, uh, moving some people from some uh, toaster related positions back into the classroom to mitigate some of those uh, class size pieces. And then the summer piece doesn't really have a, um, have a direct impact in terms of class sizes. It's not a reduction in programs for that. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, any other questions? 
Oh, uh, Mr. Brennan, thank you for running us through that uh, um, presentation there. And I want to thank, I know that the district office, this was a big lift for um, them, but also this went right down to the building level and, and the uh, staff in our buildings and the other departments to really uh, help us achieve this uh, gap closure. And um, I know I speak for myself on the board, but I'm sure the board feels this way is we want to thank everybody for really rolling up their sleeves and, and looking into that. So Dr. Johnson, thanks for leading that work. James, again, you were right there by his side. So, um, you know, we take uh, these uh, cuts not lightly, but we think that this is the uh, best way to keep it away from students. Correct, Dr. Johnson? Correct. And um, if I may, can I share a little bit more about the process moving forward? Sure. sure. So based on any feedback from the board today, uh, we plan to bring back one final update um, to the board at the next meeting on the 7th um, to take one final look at the proposed budget uh, with an anticipated uh, review and approval by the Board of Education on the 14th. And looking forward, as you folks know, uh, the governor has um, has postponed the vote, uh, school budget votes, until at least uh, after June 1st. So we're looking at potentially the earliest being the vote being on the 2nd or the 9th. <clears throat> and so if that's the case, we would schedule a budget hearing, a public budget hearing for the 21st of May. Um, and uh, working with uh, Ms. Kelly, uh, again, a lot of unknowns. We're not sure exactly how the vote would happen, um, but we're trying to, trying to prepare as best we can uh, for those things. So um, I know Ms. Kelly is, is doing a great job in trying to manage that and pull together what we can, but I just wanted to review what we see as the uh, process moving forward. Well, thank you, Dr. Johnson and Ms. Kelly, again, thank you for all your work um, with these moving timelines. I'm sure it's not easy for you to keep track of it, but we're glad you're at the helm of that because we know that we will be kept on to the calendar to meet all those deadlines that we need. Okay, um, I don't believe there's anything else in new business, so we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is consent agenda. Consent agenda is a uh, action by the board to approve multiple items with one vote. Um, so, Ms. Kelly, can I have a resolution, please? Yes. The recommended resolution is be it resolved that the Board of Education of the West Point Central School District approve the consent agenda, which includes H1 through H3. Motion, please. I'll move it. Thank you, Dr. Sackley. Second, please. Second. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Okay, consent agenda. So I'll just uh, ask, we have the resolution on the, is there any uh, uh, updates from Dr. Johnson at this point on this resolution? No, Mr. Bay. Okay. In this is Committee on Special Education and Bid on Fine Paper. Um, I'll ask any board members, is there any item that they would like to re, uh, pull out of this consent agenda to discuss in more detail? None being had. Is there any item in the uh, consent agenda that a board member would like to have removed and vote on separately. None being had, we'll go ahead and we're gonna vote on con the consent agenda. For so those all in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 Uh, Kelly, I see seven zero. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next item on the agenda, which is future board meetings. Before we go to Ms. Kelly, it's uh, just so everybody at home and other board members, as you know, we, we in between the, this section is usually um, liaison and community reports. Since school is not in succession and uh, a lot of our uh, like Monroe County school boards aren't meeting, um, there is some work being done remotely. I see now this week as some of the uh, legislative, I think Anne is starting to do some work uh, remotely. Um, I think they said that they're gonna try to get something together for some position papers or something. Um, so yeah, we've kind we're, of, yeah, we're not having a meeting though, John, for in yeah. May. Yeah, so we're trying to shrink the, there wasn't, there wouldn't be a lot to report it as school is not in session. So we'll, once that we return to what the new normal will be, we'll start to insert that back into the agenda. So just people were wondering. 
We'll go on to the next item on the agenda, which is for Ms. Kelly, which is future meetings. Ms. Kelly. The May 30th session will be Thursday, May 2nd, 7 p.m via video conference and our business meeting will be Thursday, May 14, 7 p.m. again with a video conference. Okay, so with those two board meetings, we do have two in May back to back. Um, so I would just remind board members normally um, in the past, what we have done is at the budget adoption on May 14th, which we believe that will be the date that we're adopting the budget, correct, Ms. Kelly? Yes. We uh, usually do a roll call vote at that, and that gives an opportunity for each board member to voice their vote and maybe give a one to two minute, um, just uh, why they support the budget or, or the points of the budget that they uh, would like to call out or uh, their feelings on the budget. So if you, I just wanted to remind board members to start thinking about that. If you have any questions, you can reach out to Mr. Long, myself, and we can uh, discuss it in more detail, but I will probably look for a roll call vote on the 14th for the budget adoption. Does anybody have any problems with that? Okay. We're gonna move on to the next item on the agenda, which is executive session. There is a need to, exec to adjourn to executive session tonight. Ms. Kelly, I'm gonna need some help from you because this is a little different than we normally do. So can you just lead us through this process right now? Right, we'll need a motion to go to executive session to discuss the employment history of a particular person or persons. Okay. Okay, so can I have a motion to move to executive session, please? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Metris. And a second, please. Mr. Long, thank you very much. So at this time, we're going to go ahead and vote to move to executive session. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ms. Kelly, aye. that's 7 0. So, Ms. Kelly, what do we do from here? Um, we will need to end our meeting at this point. And um, Dr. Johnson has a meeting for executive session. And then we'll just end the, do we go back into regular session and then end our meeting? Yes, we'll go back to open session as you normally would and then adjourn from the meeting altogether. Okay, so Dr. Johnson's got that, okay. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and we'll say uh, take three to five minutes. I believe Dr. Johnson has sent that invitation for the executive session. Uh, I would ask that you, we leave this meeting at this time and we'll meet up in there. And again, thank you everybody. Just another uh, thanks Hannah and Elizabeth, mm -hmm. thanks for your participation in our board meetings. It is um, great to see you at what I call our virtual table now. And again, we thank you for all your uh, support and bringing us great information from our students in the district and what's going on. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And thanks for well, hanging in there. <laughs> <a long> meeting. <laughs> I know they, they're waiting for Mr. Long to get back in the chair. <laughs> uh, so with that, we'll go ahead and end this meeting and Ms. Kelly, and we'll move to executive session. All those, again, that was in your uh, email, the link to that new executive session meeting. Thank you everybody and have a good night.